what would you say is your greatest accomplishment or achievement uh, as for working on the leftovers? Well, I would say my greatest accomplishment on the leftovers is perhaps getting to the next level of uh, my work, um, surviving the leftovers perhaps, <laughs> but I would say, you know, the leftovers was truly a life changing experience for me and many others. And, and so it really, uh, I think took me and opened me up to a lot of ideas and, um, and just, you know, I felt very free to create, uh, visually what I wanted to create as a storyteller. And that's only because, you know, we had such great writers and starting with Damon Lindelof and Tom Prada and their married group of brilliant writers. And um, cause you're only as good as your script and yes, you can elevate it visually, but the material um, really provided me with a beautiful map uh, to tell the story. Yeah, um, you know, when I speak to other people from the cast and crew, Damon and others, they always mention how you really did make quite an impact and you really did, uh, like, you contributed quite substantially and significantly to The Leftovers, which is a show, by the way, that we all say has broken so many rules about many of us find profoundly moving. What would you say, if you don't mind, talking about yourself, what would you say that you have given to this show um, as the executive producer and a director? Well, <laughs> I hate talking about myself, but um, <laughs> I will. Um, I feel like I brought uh, a bigger palette to the show. When I came on, I opened the palette up uh, with our keys, with our production designer, costume designer, art director, production designers, and cinematographers and you know really open the show up visually with color use the use of wide shots the use of the landscape as a character in the piece um against our bold close-ups and i think i really brought that to the show and um you know i just dug deep um as deep as the writers did in in you know telling the stories of these people who are so wounded like um each and every one of our actors are so incredibly brilliant. They're so incredibly deep and they'll go for anything. Uh, Justin Thoreau is fearless and he'll go to the deep end and he'll stay there uh, to, to find the character and find the honesty of the character. And Carrie Coon is also just a super mega star, uh, uh, you know, pot of every flavor you could have and she's an extraordinary actor and you know scott glenn you can't just get away from it. you just that face you know just draws you know every crevice and every line in his face you know tells the story of a warrior and and he truly is one on set off set um and uh you know we had him out in the outback just doing everything himself, um, 77 years old, just going out there and giving his everything. And um, I'm out, I, I'm just saying, we had such great actors. And so, you know, it was just such a beautiful shared experience and bringing the beautiful uh, landscapes of Australia and putting our characters in this world, uh, it was candy. It was incredible. Now, I don't even know what you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> but that's fascinating. I could let you talk all day. Um, but look, uh, for example, I spoke to Scott earlier today and we talked obviously at length about Crazy White Fuller Thinking, one of your episodes. Um, yes. You directed mostly the premieres and the uh, finale, except for the premiere of the first season, and, and then a few episodes interspersed throughout the season, but Crazy White Fella Thinking um, is special to many of us. For me personally, I'm Australian and I loved how 
um, our indigenous culture was portrayed so authentically and beautifully. But for him, he, I mean, he talked at length about the, working with you and he mentioned that you paid him a compliment that he wanted to return by saying that you, Mimi, always go to the deep end and you go there right away, you. Yeah. Um, he said that you're intense and you found a million different ways to kind of bring something new out of him. What was it like working with him on such an intense episode? Yeah, well, you know, Scott was, you know, is a, he's a veteran, you know. Scott knows and explores the depths of his character and he comes to work and he's completely prepared and he came to this experience with open arms and um, we had worked throughout the two seasons previously, you know, and done scenes together and done an episode that quite involved him in Solace for the Tired Feet, uh, episode, season one. But um, I would say that um, working with him was, you know, you're only as good as your actor. You know, yes, you can cover up stuff and do fancy things to make um, uh, things appear as if, as, as what you can trick people, you can trick your audience into a great performance or a great edited sequence. But with Scott, he was just gung ho and he went to the deep end and I kept him there. And we just had a great exploration of his character and I just let him go. You know, he was free and he was free to try anything and experience every emotion. And so directing him was, I was happy to be his tour guide. <laughs> and he, you know, if an actor is closed, it's very hard to get in there. It's very hard to be free and honest. And I would say that Scott brought such an authenticity and belief to his character and his character's wants uh, that it was, uh, you know, you know, I witnessed, we all did, you know, his greatness. And he and I had a very special relationship in that I was able to, you know, guide him along the way and, and, and find the details. Um, but he was very prepared and he's a genius and he's a joy. And, um, you know, him, you know, running around on crutches through the outback where we had nothing. I mean, we we were, you know, very minimal uh, creature comforts. And, you know, we just um, went on the journey together. And the Australian crew was absolutely extraordinary. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. They were great. And it's always your fear when you're starting up a show that's already been established, starting with a whole new crew. I mean, we brought, our, uh, I had an Australian DP and, and John Grillo was our American DP who shot and photographed crazy white fella thinking. And I brought my key operator date, Chris Cuevas, who is, is incredible. And, you know, as a team, we all got there and working with the indigenous people of Australia was a real honor and uh, a real, something, you know, that we don't learn in American schools, you know, too much about. And so it, it was like, we went to school and we got schooled and we learned about the art and we learned about, uh, you know, the languages and the culture and what had happened in Australia. I mean, we knew about what happened in Australia, just like, you know, what happened in America with the native Americans. But um, yeah. there's a very great similarity. Anyway, you know, we did a smoke ceremony, cleansing ceremony before we even started shooting that episode with the indigenous people and said prayers and gave thanks. Um, and it was uh, it was a very spiritual experience working on what white on crazy white fella thinking and it was fun. And um, yeah, it was a blessing working with Scott. That's for sure. And you know, he'd been waiting for three seasons to get his own episode. And, and, you know, I think it's his greatest performance yet, if that's possible. And, um, yeah, I think yeah. you're right. <laughs> yeah. Um, when it was just, 
when you uh, decided to relocate part of most of the third season to Australia, you were instrumental in going out there and working out where to shoot the show and, and the various logistics of it, right? What drove yeah. the decision to shoot in Victoria and in Broken Hill? Uh, well, you know, um, I went on a scout last February. Um, so, you know, it's been a year, over a year and four months, right? Something like that since we went. And, you know, I went with Gene Kelly, our other executive producer, and Tom Speziali, our other executive producer, writer, and John Pano, our production designer. And we went to visit all the states, of, um, most of the states of um, Australia. And uh, what we found in Victoria that was absolutely essential was we found a great city in, in Melbourne. And we needed city. We also needed Grace's Ranch. And we were initially were going to shoot around the uh, Hanging Rock, which we were, I was quite obsessed with, um, you know, because Hanging Rock was one of our inspirations for season two. Um, and I really looked, looked like crazy around there. We all did to find a ranch that would fit with the rock so the rock could, you know, be in its vision. But ultimately, the rock was covered by a lot of trees, and it didn't. We couldn't find the right ranch, so we actually built our ranch in the Yuyangs, and the Yuyangs are about an hour and a half, as you know, outside of Melbourne. And so that was a when we had our, and we also built our Millerite um, um, compound, you know, little village, also at the Yuyangs. So we found what we could use in Victoria, but then when we went to Broken Hill we really, I really gravitated, you know, we went to the pinnacles. And at this time, you know, I think I knew I was going to direct an episode with Scott in the Outback, but I had no idea what it was. It hadn't been written. Um, and I didn't know what it was. I don't think anybody did. But we went to the pinnacles and we went to um, the the area where um, where Scott watches the indigenous dancers to steal the song. And um, we, I, I said, you know, I, I don't know what we're shooting here, but I love this, this place. And I love these little pinnacles, you know, that stand out in the vast landscape of that area. And I wanted to shoot there. And I said, we're gonna shoot right here. I said, I don't know what we're shooting, but we're gonna shoot there. And um, we did. Um, we scouted so many areas and locations on that February scout, even the riverbed where I eventually staged uh, Scott getting bit by a snake and finding the cross, we found it in February. And then when we went back in June after shooting in um, Austin, I mean, sorry, we went back. Uh, we were in Austin shooting, I don't even know, March and April. And I shot the opener and then I left to go back to Australia and start scouting episode three because then we knew more about crazy white fellow thinking. We went back, we went back to all those same locations and actually picked the roads and, and decided where to shoot everything. And the beauty of the landscape of, of the area of Broken Hill that in that outback was, it was just so powerful. It really spoke to me and spoke to all of us and even though it was, you know, and you know how far that is, it's it's a two and a half hour flight out of Sydney, so it's about an eight hour drive, eight nine hour drive, I think, out of Sydney, and so you know it was a distant location for us, but it was well worth shooting in. In the little town of um, of Broken Hill, we used for our police station, Indigenous police station and also for the post office. And there was an artist studio there that we redid, a, that John Pano did all this indigenous art, with indigenous artists, um, the outside and inside. Um, and that was where um, um, Scott went to go find out where Chris Sunday lived and you know stole the papers and, uh, yeah, Australia. Yeah, it's pretty special. Yeah, it's very special. The light is extraordinary. 
and I loved filming there. It was great. So we are, we are, we're days we're away days of, um, from, from, from oh, sorry, I'm oh, sorry, I'm just, just, just going to go. Uh, I'm going to edit this. Um, testing. Yeah, you're, you're going in and out, but go on. Just, we just have to, okay, it's gone. It's gone. Um, we're days away from the finale. It's going to be very, very uh, moving, I, I assume. Do you think it will satisfy fans? I do think the finale will satisfy fans. I hope so. You know, I it, it certainly satisfied me, and it was very satisfying to all of us who, um, from the writing to the to me to the directing. Sorry. And I mean, it would be really great to tell us everything. I can't tell you anything, unfortunately, except that I think you'll be in for um, a, a very special hour of the leftovers. I mean, you know, I would, I would just be open to to watching it and experiencing it. Yeah, and that's what we'll do. It's uh, and it, it's just around the corner. It's just around so, the corner. Yeah, June. I was wondering. Um, you're a number of a very esteemed TV directors that just happen to be women, like Leslie Linker Gladder and Michelle McLaren come to mind, and obviously you. Why is gender less of an issue or an obstacle in television compared to film? Well, I don't know if I can truly answer that. I mean, I think. I think you could look at it and go, perhaps it's economics. Uh, you know, I gave, uh, I hired Leslie Gladder on ER when I was one of the exec producers, and I hired Michelle McLaren on uh, her first show that she directed uh, outside of X-Files uh, called John Doe. And, um, you know, it takes people in my position to hire women and you know it's gone in ebbs and flows you know we've hired the women and then there's people well we've hired the women we don't need any more but you know i keep hiring women and so do other people and maybe it's the economics of television there's not as much as stake at stake in terms of the economics um i don't know i mean i think um i like to look at directors as you know, not as a gender, but as how great they are, male or female. You know, it's like you look at the artist and you look at their work and then you, you know, you hire them. Um, you know, you know, there are, you know, male directors, some better than others. There are female directors, some better than others. Um, you know, it's such a, it's an issue that's been talked about ad nauseum. And I, I, I don't know if I'll see the day where it's not talked about, you know, but, um, and, you know, it's just that you never say, oh, you are, you never say to a male, you're a great uh, male director, but it's often put in print, uh, Mimi Leader, female director, you know, it's, it's like, director i'm a director you know and it's it's just very interesting and and you know we're all working hard and the best way to to change this is to work hard and do great work and hire as many women as you can and because it's like riding a bike you're only as good as if you're able to continue doing it you know it's not something you are can be great at if you don't do it all the time Anyway, that's fine. Um, given your impressive list of TV and film credit, um, you know, all the way back to LA Law and, and now oh, with wow. the leftovers, I know, it's been a while, hasn't it? I mean, what would you say that you learned most from those early those early years, your experience as a, as a director? Yeah, well, as a younger director, you know, um, there was a lot of fear attached to directing. And I think that is, for most people, and but I actually think fear is the great motivator and I still have a lot of fear and um, but what I learned 
as a young director was to let things go. Um, things happen on set to be spontaneous, to be open, to be collaborative. And, you know, nothing fits into a box. You have to be open for the unexpected, for great things to happen. And you have to, you know, so as a young director, you have to learn how to trust your instincts. And now I pretty much obviously still, I do trust my instincts. The fear is still there every time, like the first time, but that doesn't last very long because ultimately what happens is the experience, you know, becomes one that is hopefully extraordinary and, um, and moving. Yeah. Um, you know, you won two Emmys back in 95 and 96. I don't actually remember the 95 one. I remember you bounding up on stage. You were so obviously overjoyed and thrilled because you won two consecutive directing it sweeter or the rare second consecutive seal of approval. Yeah, well, I won the first one for directing. I've been nominated nine times. Yeah. I won the second one for producing ER. And I was in um, a little small town in Martin, Slovakia, like two hours from the Polish border. And I was filming, um, I was filming a um, Peacemaker, the Peacemaker with George Clooney and Nicole Kidman. And uh, it was three in the morning. I had them, I asked them to set up a satellite so I could watch the Emmys. And that's why you didn't see me because I was sitting in a room with some technicians and a few people in their pajamas. They were all asleep, but I was awake <laughs> watching us win the Emmy. And yeah, winning the Emmy for directing was, it was a great experience. It was absolutely terrifying, but it was, it was a wonderful, um, it was wonderful. I loved it, obviously. Yeah. And and finally, um, what do you think you'll, as, you know, 10 years from now, when you think back on your experience on The Leftovers, is there anything, one thing that you think that you will always hold about your, your work on that show? Well, I think I, it, it, you know, it was a life-changing experience, I think, for all of us, as I've said, as I said. And it was one of those times where, everything just works you know the writing the directing the acting the extraordinary group of actors the um the mind-blowing writing it just you know when all the things in the universe you know hit at one moment that was that was one of those moments for for all of us that i'll always remember and it was a time where I can, you know, it's just time, it's very fresh in my mind because we just finished it, but, you know, it was an experience that uh, really I felt very free to expand my wings and, and just direct the hell out of the show as, as I saw it and felt it. And it was like shooting a little movie every, you know, every 12 days or something. It was, it was, it was one of the great experiences of my career, I must say, and I'm very proud of it. I loved it. Yeah, and hopefully, hopefully, we'll see you at the um at the Emmys later this year and finally get some recognition for your work on the show. Thanks, Ming, for your time today. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye.